Hello, everyone, and welcome to the talk on the product and technical direction of edX mobile apps. I'm Purnima, and I'm a product manager on the mobile apps for Open Courses team here at TUU. And today, along with Mia Khalid and Saeed Bashir, I'm excited to share our insights with you all. First, I would love to introduce the team that's behind bringing you the mobile apps. We are 12 members that are located in Cambridge and Lahore. We're a cross-functional team that has expertise in all different areas that are needed to build mobile, native mobile apps, from a user experience lead to Android engineers and iOS engineers we also have a dedicated backend engineer and a QA team. And together, our goal is to build a fully mobile learning experience. So why are we investing in mobile apps? Well, we know today that over 55% of edX learners rely on their phones to learn. And we believe that this number is growing and will continue to grow. We also know from data and user interviews that learners use their phones for convenience, focus, video experiences, and efficiency. However, when they encounter interruptions or feature gaps on their phone, like payments, search, complicated course structures, and unsupported assignment types, some learners move to the laptop, but a vast majority of them drop off and they miss their learning goals. We did over 30 uh, hours of interviews with learners who learn on their mobile phones and then use this data to categorize their needs into a hierarchy to better plan our roadmap and investment areas. This pyramid here shows the most basic needs of these learners at the bottom of the pyramid and the more self-fulfillment needs towards the top. So at the very basic level, learners want a frictionless learning experience where they don't have to depend on access to a laptop or a desktop to learn. After that, they look for their mobile device for support with their learning. They rely on their phone for a range of activities outside of learning to keep them motivated and organized. And learning is no different. They want their phones to help them stick to their learning goals. Further, they use their phones for transformational learning outcomes that range from completion to obtaining certificates to reviewing and retaining what they've learned. Ultimately, our vision is for edX to be the best in class learning app that brings access to transformational learning opportunities to learners wherever they may be. We want to meet learners where they are. So here are some highlights of the features that we have released in the last few quarters to realize this vision. Firstly, in order to give users a frictionless experience, we build explanations for why some content is not accessible to them and how they can unlock it. It's our first foray into in-app payments. Previously, users had no idea why a component was unavailable. It could have been either because it was behind a paywall or because it was unsupported in the app. Now they have a better idea. Speaking of unsupported content, we have been investing in enabling more and more X block types in the apps. Over 98% of our components today are now enabled in the app. We also give users a preview of the X block by rendering it in the app to the best of our ability and we give them options to open it in the browser as well, if they prefer. If they choose to open it in the browser, they don't have to re-log in, further removing interruptions in their learning experience. 
We've also made it easier for users to pick up where they left off in the course quickly. With check marks at various levels of the course structure, they can understand their progress easily. With progress indicators also sync across web and mobile, allowing them to move across platforms seamlessly. We've also added a resume button that takes users to their first incomplete component of the course so that they don't have to click through the outlines to find what to do next. We've also made investments in the higher levels of the needs hierarchy by taking advantage of the unique capabilities of mobile apps that may not be available on other platforms. One such example is the video download quality options feature, where the learner can select the quality of the videos that they're downloading. Downloading videos for offline use is a uniquely mobile use case. It's very popular among our app users. And after hearing consistent feedback from them, we've enhanced it to better serve the needs of these learners. Now they can pick the quality of the video they prefer to download, depending upon their internet speed and the device storage capacity. The second example is calendar integration, another popular use case for mobile users. Our learners uh, of edX during our interviews have said that they create blocks of times on their calendars to fit learning into their routines. That's the only way they ensure that they can complete uh, the courses that they're enrolled in. We built this feature so that more learners can incorporate learning into their, their learning routines and not miss um, any learning goals. When a learner chooses to sync their course dates, we create events in their calendars. When an assignment is due, the learner gets two alerts. The first one at 24 hours before the assignment is due and another one an hour before. These events are also updated when a learner shifts dates uh, for their course or if an instructor updates their course schedule. Lastly, we're making use of automatic and ad hoc notifications and using them judiciously to inform users when um, there's a deadline approaching or if we have important updates in the app. These notifications are further enhanced by deep links, which take users directly to the part of the app where they can take action. For instance, the calendar entries mentioned earlier contain deep links to the assignments. So when a user taps on the notification, they can quickly access the assignment by tapping on the deep link in their calendar entry, going directly to the assignment section of the, of the course. Last but not least, we have enhanced language support in 10 different languages. We've invested in internal processes and made changes to the app so that existing and new strings are translated into all supported languages quickly. This will let learners experience our app in the language of their choice. Next, I would like to talk a bit about two major projects that are in the pipeline um, that we're hoping to release in the next few months and quarters. The first is in-app payments. Mobile learners constitute a highly engaged cohort who prefer to stay on their phones for as long as possible. This is either by choice or simply due to lack of access to other devices. Moreover, we've heard from mobile learners that they can't figure out how to upgrade after seeing logged content or that they don't have access to the right payment methods to upgrade. They want to upgrade, but just cannot. This project enables payments in apps by integrating with Apple and Google's payment systems. With these systems, 
users will be able to choose from a variety of different payment options and will easily be able to access uh, upgrade options with a couple of clicks with the payment information that's already stored in their Apple and Google profiles. The next exciting project is a redesign of the app's core navigation. We learned from qualitative and quantitative data, UX best practices, and competitive analysis that performing high value engagement actions like watching a video, posting in a forum, and discovering features has become complex in our current mobile apps. On a given day, 60% of the interactions with the app by logged in users do not involve interacting with the content that they're enrolled in. We also deviate from the model of other learning apps in that we have an extra layer between our course outline and our course content, resulting in a more complex information architecture and extra interaction and hierarchy to navigate. We believe that a redesigned app navigation will not only help learners find the content and features that they're looking for quickly, but also help with scalability of the app. We're redesigning the navigation for simplicity, consistent cross-device experience, native patterns, streamlined learning, and scalability. We are making navigation improvements in five key areas listed on the slide, namely app level tabs, course outline, course content, the discovery experience, and the profile. We have done extensive user testing with prototypes and will be releasing these features as milestones. Some of the milestones like the profile are already in the production apps if you want to check, check it out. And we can't wait to share more with you in the next few months. With that, I would like to hand it over to Khaled, our fearless technical team lead, to share insights about our technical direction. Thank you. Thanks, Pranima. Hey, everyone. My name is Mia Khaled. I'm a solution architect at Arbisoft. I've been working with edX for more than six years now. I started off as an Android engineer on the, on the team, and currently I'm leading the development team of edX mobile apps. Today, I'll be uh, going over the technical direction of our mobile apps. So let's first talk about what we do and how we do it from a technical perspective. Our overall development process is currently standing on five major pillars that include development, feature testing, release, post-release analysis, and support procedures. We'll be going through all these pillars one by one to expand on them a bit more. So let's jump right in. First up is development. During development, the first thing that we decide is whether to put a feature behind a feature flag or not. After that comes the question of whether the feature flag should be local or remote. By the way, don't worry at this point as I'll be covering each of these points separately in upcoming slides. Then we check to see if the backend is ready or if some changes are needed. iOS and Android design systems are inherently different and we are really fortunate to have a design team that respects this fact and is always willing to follow each platform guidelines to our advantage. I'll be going over an example of this in an upcoming slide. We use an incremental approach to launch features in our apps by dividing them into milestones and getting user feedback before adding new enhancements. All of this is possible with strict code reviews and performance testing by peers. So during development, how do we decide whether something goes behind a feature flag? The rule is quite simple. If it's a core feature, like showing a list of enrolled courses to a user, it, was, it will always be available without the need of putting it behind a feature flag. 
but for instances where we feel like the community would want to pick and choose from a range of feature sets, we give the option to customize the app according to their business needs through feature plans. For example, registration is a feature that you can enable or disable if you want. For the list of features and their feature flags, please have a look at the wiki link at the bottom. Now let's have a look at the differences between a local feature flag versus a remote feature flag. Local flag is one that lives in our configs. Remote flag is one that lives in Firebase remote config, at least in our case. There might be some alternatives to Firebase remote config, but uh, at edX and we are currently using Firebase Remote Config for our remote feature flags. For a, for a local feature flag, code changes are required to enable disabled features, but enabling disabling features uh, without code in case of remote uh, feature flag doesn't require a code change. Local flag is only applicable during the build time. Remote flag can be changed at any point, even after release. Local flag doesn't require internet to be fetched. Remote flag needs internet to be fetched and be cached as well. Local flag is usually written uh, in YAML format, but remote flag is written in JSON format. Local flag doesn't require a third party service, while a uh, remote flag does require a third party service in, the, in our case where you're in Firebase remote control. An example of a local flag is uh, native discovery versus web discovery, one of which can, can be enabled through local flag. An example of remote flag is our calendar sync feature, which can be enabled at any point in time uh, using the remote flag. And as always, uh, you can have a look at all the uh, local and remote uh, feature flags on this wiki, link below. So I can't emphasize enough on this enough, but backend readiness is a major contributor towards the success of a feature. Take for example, a recent case where we had to show special exams to our learners, to let our learners know that special exams are part of the course outline so that they aren't part by surprise. For this, we introduce some additional QE parameters in the blocks API and enhancing, enhancing its capability to return special exams in its response. On the right side of the slide, I've highlighted the three additional parameters that got added to the blocks API call. And the effects of it can be seen as the practice timed exam is now appearing on the course dashboard in the screenshot on the right side, as opposed to the screenshot on the left for the same course that didn't have it before the switch. Moving on to platform specific differences, a huge shout out again to our design team that takes into account the guidelines of each platform and comes up with designs that are intuitive and familiar to our user base on each platform. Take, for example, the course dashboard screen, where the tabs in case of our iOS app are at the bottom versus on Android, the tabs are at the top, which is usually the case for most of the apps on iOS and Android, uh, where the positioning of tabs is different. Similarly, on the discussion screen, to filter the posts on iOS, we show an action sheet at the bottom as compared to the Android, where we have an inline pop-up for this use case. We use the milestones approach to re release faster and get early feedback. What it means is that a feature gets divided into multiple milestones so we can see the impact per milestone spaces. For example, the calendar sync feature got divided into four milestones. In our first iteration, we enabled the feature for only self-paced courses. In the second iteration, we enabled it for instructor-based courses. In the third iteration, we added the ability to have deep links baked right into calendar events, giving users the ability to jump right into a course unit from a reminder. 
In the fourth iteration, we are planning to enhance the feature even more. With, developer, with development comes the behemoth task of making sure a feature is working as expected and is crash free leading us to the second pillar, which is feature testing. Our QA team puts in lots of efforts to ensure a smooth crash-free experience that our learners love and enjoy. For this, they have written extensive small and revision test cases that are validated on test fields, plus they do sanity testing for the releases. And in parallel, test automation is also done to make sure that uh, if someone doesn't have uh, the capability uh, or the capacity to do manual test cases, run the manual test cases suite, they can uh, make do with the automation test suite that we provide. So for our smoke test, uh, test suite, it includes 680 plus test cases. Similarly, for our regression test suite, it includes 1,000 test cases thousand plus test cases. And as far as sanity, sanity testing is concerned, uh, for release, it has around 70 plus test cases. And when it comes to automation, our automation suite currently covers 80% of the Android app and 72% of the iOS app. So if you are short on peer resources in your team, this automation suite can definitely help by giving you an extensive report on whether the app is compiling properly or not, and if all the enabled features are working as expected. With that, I would like to hand over to my partner in crime for the past few years to explain the remaining three players, pillars for our technical direction. Take it away, Saeed. Thank you, Khalid. I'm Saeed Shi. I'm a solution architect at RBSoft and it's been five years I have been working on Adex mobile apps and I'm taking care of the IFS. As Khalid explained our extensive testing procedures for our mobile apps, here is how it translates into numbers. We have currently maintaining 99.5% patch free users on both platforms. So the community doesn't have to worry about the stability and just focus on value addition. Let us now look at our release process. We start with freezing the code and cutting the release branch from master, which helps us in doing the development in parallel with the release. Then we start with the words new images and messages to help with onboarding learners with the newly released features. Then we provide builds to our test team for testing and features validation. After the testing approval, we push the builds for stores approval. Then we release the versions on the respective stores, App Store or Play Store that is. And in case of Android, we play it safe and always release with space to roll out starting from 20% of our average user base. If you wanna look at the process in detail, we documented it for both platforms and it can be found on the Gamer Notes. Post release analysis. After releasing the new versions to the app stores, we create the release tags on the GitHub so the community can benefit from it and update their apps to the latest version. To keep the community updated, we always post about a new release in our open edX mobile channel. <clears throat> now we start monitoring the app's adoption on Firebase and keep, keep an eye on the stability through the crash release. In case crash analytics reports a crash that impacts a good amount of our learners, we prioritize the crash, fix it, and patch the release. After considerable adoption, if we don't see a spike in crashes, we configure the version-based app upgrade on Django admin, which supplements the adoption in a mode. We have two options for app upgrade messaging, for soft and force. We use force upgrade for versions which we want to drop and soft in case of versions we want the learners to upgrade to. Support procedures. Right after releasing the new version to the app stores, we inform our learner support team about new features and known issues in the release, which then get updated on the website under help and facts. In case if learners force some issues to the support team, we help them to troubleshoot them, giving them work around to resolve the issue and if possible. In case of a genuine issue, we triage 
the issue with the product team fix it and decide if a patch release is needed for or uh, the fix can go as part of the next release depending on the priority given by the product team let's now take a use case to see the whole process in action we picked it because all the learners requested it in our user interviews this is purely mobile specific feature that helps a learner stay on track with opponent dates of a course by adding these dates to the learner's calendar. This is also a place where we leverage this platform capability and use them to our advantage. That is Google. That is for Google, we used Google Calendar, and on iOS, we use the iCalendar. Seeing the impact this feature had created, we enhanced it by adding support for date links and reminder notification to help a learner jump right into our course unit. So this was the most wondered feature by the learners and they loved it. Although initially we launched it for just for the self-paced courses, even then it was used 20,000 times over the span of two months. It was, it also increased the overall mobile engagement to percent. After seeing the really positive response, we moved on to releasing it for instructor based courses as well. And that's about it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Well, I have one. Um, I was wondering, is there a limit to how many notifications you send a user in one day? For example, if they had a lot of um, assignments that were due? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the notifications are based on uh, whatever the courses uh, timeline is accordingly. So most courses don't have uh, like uh, same assignment uh, assignments, multiple assignments on this on the same date. So uh, we just send notifications based on that, based on that. And as far as the other notifications are concerned, we don't usually send more than once uh, a month or a week. So the cadence of us sending specific notifications is very low. We don't usually bombard them with notifications ever. Them. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll hand it off to another question. Thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with the calendar sync um, function till now, but um, as I understood now, it's um, synced with um, existing Google Calendar. So, what happens if someone is not having any Google Calendar or some? function so there's no option to get these notifications just from um, the edX calendar so by not having a Google calendar you mean that a user doesn't have the calendar app or doesn't have a Google uh, account on their calendar app? maybe both because it both uh, both is required to sync right you you have the app yes, so and you have to have an, a Google account Yes, yeah, so, so we have got uh, this covered. Uh, we tested on multiple uh, OEMs that don't provide Google Calendar as the default app. So it the, the feature works uh, as expected. So in that case, the events won't be synced across multiple devices because the Google account isn't uh, synced on, uh, on that device. So the events will be added to the calendar app that the platform provides. Uh, and the just the catch here is that those events won't be synced to other devices that the user has that maybe have the same calendar app. But since uh, it, is, it isn't using the Google service, uh, so we won't be syncing those events across those devices. Okay, thank you. And in case of iOS, it's quite different because we, we use the iCalendar app, so uh, it, it gets synced, uh, synced across uh, the whole ecosystem. The Mac, uh, the iPhone, iPad, whatever is, uh, added on that specific uh, 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 iCloud account. 
Okay, um, we have a question from the chat from Vanit. Um, on the same topic of calendar sync, a significant population used Microsoft Apps and Microsoft Outlook on mobile devices. Does sync work with Outlook by default? I think we tried that app as well, yes. Uh, as far as I remember, I tried it personally on my own device and it did, it did work. So we tried it for like uh, multiple uh, providers like Xiaomi and uh, Samsung Pixel. Uh, and on those uh, devices, we installed the Outlook uh, app as well. Uh, I think that works as far as I can remember. Yeah, it does. Awesome. We've got another question. Okay, my, my question is if uh, someone from the community, like any of the edX uh, service provider or solution provider, would like to use uh, these Android and iOS mobile apps, how easy it is to white label them according to their own needs? Okay, so as far as white labeling these apps is concerned, uh, in the past we had written some scripts which used to change like, so to white label an app, first you need to decide like what needs to be changed. So the basic things that one can think of is the color scheme and the logo. So that's a, that, that is pretty uh, easy. Like you can all the uh, images in the relevant directories. And we have a, uh, a single file that has all the colors, the brand color, the brand accent color, and stuff like that. So changing those colors would affect the whole app. Uh, and as far as the features are concerned, so that might get a bit tricky because some features sometimes require some third-party services like Firebase. So if uh, a provider isn't using Firebase uh, or using some service from the Amazon for, for the same uh, feature, so that might get a bit tricky because uh, as of now, we only support like uh, most of the services, services that are provided in the Firebase suite. Uh, and as far as the services or the features that don't require uh, third-party services, that can be enabled quite easily from the configs. Uh, those are all uh, mostly the lo local configs that can be used. Uh, like the registration feature, it can be disabled, enabled based on whatever the business requirements are. And uh, other things like the dates uh, feature, the calendar feature, those are readily available. Those, those don't require any specific third-party uh, integration. Uh, Say, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because I think uh, calendar feature also uses some uh, service for deep things, right? So that can be disabled. Uh, yes. So everything on mobile is configurable through the configuration file, even uh, even the third party apps, uh, like if we, uh, if we want to use uh, the Google services and the Firebase services. So we have provided a mechanism uh, in which uh, uh, the provider have to uh, enter uh, the required keys, like the GSM sender key or the other stuff and which feature uh, someone want to use. So he just need to, uh, add the configuration in the config file and after that it will start working uh, with the third party uh, libraries as well awesome thank you i think we have another one from the chat um yeah, this we have two. oh we have two so the first one is from zachary um is there documentation provided to get the applications built and hosted on app stores for the latest open edx stable release i'm also concerned about configuration with firebase provisioning setup for enabling features do you have documentation for configuring that too do you want to take this question go ahead Hal. so as far, uh, as far as the documentation is concerned, so uh, the readme file on our, on our repos is uh, pretty much always updated. And it also highlights which uh, platform version the current release supports. So with every release that we do, we also specifically call out that, uh, hey, this release 
works with, or we have tested it with like Picus or Ironwood or whatever the latest release is. So uh, that uh, the, uh, the readme file of uh, each of our repos tells that. And uh, the other question that you have uh, is regarding feature enabling. So yeah, the documentation on that is uh, pretty much updated as well, as well. I think the only thing that is remaining that we need to update is uh, the calendar feature. We will get the updated updated uh, uh, very very soon, uh, most probably after this uh, presentation as well. Uh, I can share the link in the chat. Uh, I'll also share the link of this presentation. Uh, it has all the important links, uh, mainly app configuration flags. Wiki is the one uh, is the go to link for all the feature flags or uh, the the usual flags that need to be used to enable certain features. Hope that answers the question. If not. Uh, let Thank you so much. Um, is there any other questions from the room before? Okay, I have one question in the room and then I'll get to the next one in the chat. Hello, I'd like to address an elephant in the room. Uh, are we having any strategic plans? Because uh, the current uh, mobile code base is like 80 years old or something, are we going to stick to cosmetic changes or we will eventually redo it in whatever, more n n newer technologies? Yeah, very good question. Uh, uh, one that I'm very excited to talk about, uh, and this is kind of a, a topic that is close to my heart as well. So as part of this, uh, I totally agree that our code bases are a bit old in terms of uh, technical like patterns or uh, like the guidelines that we are using. We are actively working on that in the sense that recently we removed uh, on the Android side, we removed RoboJuice in, in favor of Hilt. So uh, we also have uh, like maintenance tickets in our backlog that are uh, directed, directed directly towards these uh, issues and we're trying to fix the, the code as we go. Other than that, uh, we're also looking for the new uh, things that are coming on both platforms, like there's Compose on Android side. Uh, we're looking into that as well, learning along the way. And in case of iOS, there's Swift UI. Uh, you, you, might have, uh, you folks might have noticed recently that we dropped support for iOS 11 or 12 recently, uh, which is what was required to, to start using Swift UI because uh, Swift UI is, is supported after uh, starting from iOS 30. Uh, say, correct me if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> yeah. So we're actually looking into these yeah. things. Okay. So uh, we have plans to do this, but uh, as Purnima had mentioned in the, uh, in the presentation start, that our main focus these days is in app payments. So enabling the users to pay from the mobile phones is our top uh, top top priority currently, and with that we are also trying to deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more question in the chat until um, we're finished up. It's from the neat. Um, are there any? Sorry, are there conversations or thinking around moving away from an app-based approach for mobile users, say using hybrid or progressive web apps? Reason I ask is that maintaining three sets of apps for a standard customer implementation, one each for web, Android, and iOS, is quite taxing from a maintainability perspective. Uh. Oh, I think you're still muted. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. So as far as the plans are concerned, uh, we aren't uh, going to like sunset our native apps in, in favor of hybrid apps or progressive web apps. Uh, and in terms of maintaining the apps, if, from, if you're talking from uh, a provi provider's perspective, as Saeed has mentioned uh, during his, uh, uh, I guess, release or maintenance, uh, that 
currently our core base is both our code bases are 99.5 above percent crash free so if a provider is using our code base and uh, deploying their apps without changing much of it uh, they they'll be sure to have a stable app running without any issues so the maintenance cost is pretty low in terms of uh, the crash or the change that needs to happen if there are just the cosmetic changes that need to happen and they're using the provided tool set for uh, enabling features but uh, yeah the, i think that's about it we aren't currently planning for pws or hybrid apps because the our apps readily use some uh, so part of parts of the app are already web views like you can see the word cloud uh, the, the auras those are already the xbox that are being uh, being uh, presented to the users as web views so yeah i don't think we have any plans to move the whole app towards a web view or pwa Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that's going to have to be the end of it. So if everyone wants to give a hand to our presenters.